Det er sådan en YouTube channel. Ja. Ja, det er sådan det, som rammer med øjne. Øh, uh, hvor er det bare sådan en med? Kun de der 13 videos? From the YouTube? Ja. Yeah. Hi guys, welcome to episode 52 of the Grapplers Academy. Uh, before we get started, make sure you hit that like button, subscribe button, and share your thoughts in the comments below. And share this with your friends. Like, the more we can spread the word about grappling and sort of get the conversation going, the more we're going to get into the sport. Yeah, there's some exciting stuff happening in grappling at the moment, isn't there? Yeah. Uh, competitions are getting back more frequent, there's more stuff to talk about. And more people are getting back to training as well. Yeah. Um, so lots of stuff to talk about and share around and introduce new people into the sport. So oh, definitely. Share it with somebody who's not done jiu-jitsu before or share it with your savage blue belt friends mm. on the mats. Yeah, definitely. And those who are looking to compete in the near future, we've got Empire next month. We've got All Stars. And I'm pretty sure 24-7 I've got something coming up. Um... I've not seen too much about 24-7, but they all tend to sort of arrange events around a similar time. Yeah, I'm going to hope that it wasn't like, uh, I imagined it would be in lockdown where we get a date to come out of lockdown and then everybody announces a, a tournament day on the yeah. same weekend. <laughs> yeah. um, I, don't know where, I don't know how the tournament guys work it between them, the guys who run the events, because obviously you don't want three events in quick succession with them, but it's no. not like who's going to be the first yeah. tournament to come out. Uh, I don't know, I, like, you speak to a couple of the guys who organise the events, don't you? Yeah, tell, yeah. They communicate between themselves, um, or they kind of just go off their own schedule with it. I think there's a bit of communication, because it doesn't make sense, really, does it, to have them all on the same weekend, and on the sort of same day where competitors are essentially picking between who to go to, and you're either going to get really thin divisions, or you're going to get one really heavy division, and then... The other, comp- the other competitions are going to miss out on entrance so I think because they do tend to be like sort of either weekend succession or like within two or three weeks apart which I think works quite well I mean, it's sounds quite nice is what we were talking about last week if you're a competitor who wants to try and get some experience mm. in, in Jiu Jitsu like having that option to compete once a month or yeah. every couple of weeks is great um but I mean that's another downside to like why I've not competed as much over the years because you turn up to these tournaments and you might only have one or two people in your division mm-hmm. and that's fine but uh, you know you're paying to turn up for the tournament and yeah. you, want, you want to get a decent couple of matches oh yeah um, so there's pros and cons to it like more events is better for everybody but it kind of means that it gets down you're down a little bit and people are either being more selective about which ones they're doing or just outright doom one and then being like this is the one that I'm going to go for every time mm. and then stick with that yeah because I can imagine that there'd be a sort of high degree of communication between the, the I don't know if uh, there's a number of different companies but you can, there is a you can argue that there is a space for all of them mm. and with a good level of communication you can be like okay the tournament season's coming up we want to have four events this year and we're gonna we're wanting to go for these three dates or these four dates what are you planning on doing? What days are you going in? So then you just can be like, okay, we could essentially have them a month apart. And then if you've got three big companies, four events a year, that's one tournament essentially every month. And you're not splitting the competitors amongst themselves for trying to either wait until the entrance list comes out to see who's got the most in the bracket. Or if someone's got like, okay, I know this person's a tough match, this person's a tough match, so I'm going to go to this one. You sort of, everyone gets that level level playing field. Yeah. I mean, I, even if you don't plan on competing, it's good to go down and spectate in these tournaments. Yeah. Um, there's always pretty exciting matches and uh, you know, quite exciting decisions as well because when we watch high-level jiu-jitsu, oftentimes there's not as much excitement in the match. No. Like, um, judo is a great example of this, isn't it? You know, the, the competitors match each other out quite well and it quite often becomes a stalemate. Mm. Whereas when we're talking about the, there might be a bit of skill discrepancy in a bracket, um, you can get some exciting stuff happening, yeah. like some decent flying submissions, and you can also get some pretty dodgy decisions as yeah. well. <laughs> <laughs> um, like a lot of people getting mad about stuff happening that's weird, like... Um, 
dodgy slams or oh yeah it's like the one that I sent you that's been that's been on the Reddit uh, BGJ forum where the so it looks like it looks like somebody's gone in for a single leg and then the person who's been single leg has sort of almost jumped up to attack a guillotine the person who's got the single leg takes him down results in a slam but the general understanding of the rule set is if a slam is initiated from a takedown and not picked up from the ground, it's fine. Like, you're not picking somebody from closed guard, lifting them up and slamming them. You're initiating a takedown, and if they decide to jump on a submission halfway through that, they're giving themselves more air, they're not exactly putting a, being put in a dangerous position by the other person. Yeah, this video that's floating around on the Reddit forum is the person doing the takedown and getting DQ'd for a slam. So we all know why the rules are there for slams, it's to protect, you know, basically protecting necks, isn't it? Necks yeah. and shoulders. And uh, this one, this one particular thing, if you've not seen it on the Reddit, uh, we'll try and link it in the notes so you can click through and see, but it's just straight onto the flat of the back. Yeah. I mean, it's probably going to have winded him yeah. uh, at worst, but... I mean, you can make the argument that there's some concussive damage there to the head as well. Mm. Um, you know, everyone's on, on topic about CT or whatever. But it wasn't one of these, like, tombstone pile driver sort of things. No. And we were just saying before we started recording as well that there's a difference between being in somebody's closed guard or they've got you in a triangle and then you stand up and slam them on the head mm. um, to try and escape the submission versus somebody like in this incident who's jumped on top of their opponent. If you're making yourself airborne and you're going to say to your opponent, but fuck you, you're going to carry me. Yeah. Well, it's open, a fair game for me. Yeah. Whereas the person who's getting spiked on the head from trying to just do a submission from the floor, that's not fair because they've kind of not consented to that as much. Mm. Like, I always feel like if, you, if you're going to try and jump on me <laughs> and make me carry your weight, like... Be prepared to get... market. Yeah. yeah. Be prepared to get your back run into the map. <laughs> and I don't know, I don't know whether the guy... Because the video's quite short, isn't it? Mm. I don't know whether the guy you got slammed was just that bothered about it no um, the referee just called it as a DQ straight away didn't he yeah. uh, I would imagine that he's had that done to him more than once if that's his go to takedown and he probably would have just been quite happy carrying on oh definitely and like you say like the onus is on somebody who's leaving the ground to jump on a standing opponent like there's a reason why in the lower levels jumping guard isn't allowed because there's a massive risk of knee injuries and how can you expect somebody to carry your own body weight? Like, it happened with uh, Josh Hinger against Dinners. He went for a flying armbar, missed the armbar, landed flat on his back. I think he concussed himself during the match, but it resulted in him losing the match because he wasn't very aware of where he was. But Hinger took the onus on that. Like, he, it, was, it was his um, fault. So... I don't see why the person initiated the takedown got DQ for it. I'm just trying to think now, and I'm struggling to think who the match is, but I want to say it's Gary Tonin. Uh, sorry, not Gary Tonin, Jeff Glover, but I'm not sure. Is it. he got knocked out um, in the ADCC? Like, they got they got knocked out in an ADCC match, didn't they? And then came to after they got the guard passed, and I'm pretty sure they were controlling the triangle, got slammed. Then the, the guy passed around the guard, was holding side control, not really doing much, and then he came to underneath from the bottom. I'm not too sure. Oh, I can't remember. I was just quickly looking for it. I, don't know. I thought it was Jeff Glover, but it's not Sounds sure. like a Jeff Glover. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it is dangerous. Yeah. Um, I think we might have even covered the match. Yeah, they we have, but it I can't think of it. Is. Jeff Glover and the short of Matt Gio Martinez. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, that was quite a dangerous one because he was out cold and that didn't get stopped. No. And <laughs> what was weird about that is he was fully out and the match progressed. Yeah. And he just got set side control and didn't really do anything. Mm. I don't know what was going on there, whether they both knew, well, whether. I can't remember who slammed who. I have a feeling it was. Jeff Gore was out. Was slamming Geo. Right, okay. Well, whichever way around it was, it wasn't the nicest thing to watch because. No. You can tell when somebody's out and I imagine from. The top player, if you slam somebody, you know you can feel whether they're out as well. Yeah, but like I said, I, st- I, I pretty strongly disagree with the match. Like, if anyone's going to get DQ, it's going to be the person leaving the ground to jump on a flying attack. Yeah. Um. Other than that, 
let the match continue. Yeah, I mean, like kind of flying scissor takedowns and stuff like that. You know, if you if that is a move that you're going to try and pull off in competition, you need to practice it in the gym. Yeah. Um, so, I don't know. It's just a big risk, isn't it? You, you know, if you, I don't see many uh, 90 kilo people throwing in those flying scissor takedowns. No. It's definitely a lighter person thing, but it's still, let's say, 70 kilos going at the side of the knee. It doesn't take much pressure, as we all know, for that for the ligaments and tendons to get yeah. damaged pretty severely. Um, so, yeah, it, it is what it is. Uh, it's all part of jiu-jitsu, but there's some things where we're, you know, we're looking at com- protecting the competitor or are we looking at cheating a rule set? Because I think some people do encourage a slam to get a DQ out of the, out of the ref. You know, yeah. They kind of make it look a little bit more than it is. Um, well, we've all seen it with the reaping as well, haven't we? Where mm-hmm. someone's going straight for a straight footlock, and the person being footlocked pushes that foot across yeah. the uh, across the hip, shouts the referee over, and then they're celebrating like they just won the world championships <laughs> off getting their opponent DQ'd as opposed to actually winning the match. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like at the end of the day, if you had to do that to escape it, you were going to lose the match from from the footlock. I'm not sure there's a better example of like crying off a footlock though than Ernest Santos. I know we talk about it quite often, but I mean his leg was pretty much broken or whatever was up with him, and then somebody in the crowd's pissing him off and he gets up and Eric Cantona's and runs like, across flying side kick like he's out of the Matrix. That's Amazing. like some Wolverine type healing that like he's just going from being knees broken to sprinting across and the fly kick off the stage. That's it's a few feet off the floor as well, isn't it? It was impressive. There was some good athleticism yeah. on that. I mean, he's definitely playing street rules. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's always, isn't it? You know. I was talking about it last night, actually, showing um, showing a few mates, like his Joey's takedown reel and mm. how brutal his judo is. And again, with his judo and his throws, he doesn't throw them to land them on the back. He throws them to land them on their face. So what's the difference between him doing that, intentionally trying to throw somebody on their head to this decision here where someone's jumped up for a guillotine from a single leg and got taken down mid-air and gets DQ from it. It's kind of like the same, isn't it? You know, uh, wrestling, wrestlers are trying to put you on your butt. Yeah. Judo because they're trying to put you on your head. Yeah. Uh, some of those judo takedowns are deadly. And you, when you think about like the actual practical application of what a judo throw is designed to do, it ain't supposed to be putting you down on a nice soft mat. No. Like, that's your head or face in the car. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, fuck that. <laughs> yeah, no chance. It's a shame that Herbert's such a meme of himself mm. um, because he's actually a really good jiu-jitsu player. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't like... It seems like he had a good performance. I've not watched the match yet, but I've heard he had a good performance over the weekend. I think it might have been against either Yori Samoish. Oh, right, okay, yeah. Um, it's a good card, that, wasn't it? I'm not seeing the card yet. I need. To, I'm gonna uh, spend a bit of time this week sort of watching the matches, but it looked like there were some really good matches on there. The big one that's popped up is Denis and Hulk, isn't it? Yeah. Because of the controversy based off that talking about <laughs> dodgy decision making in jiu jitsu. Uh, fill us in on that one. So yeah, like I've only seen the highlights so far, and from what I can gather, it was a pretty one sided match. Hulk was up and winning, and. Did his sort of got his way on to Hulk's back. They ended up on the floor and he sunk in a single arm rear naked. Seconds left in the timer. The timer goes, did his let's go, and it turns out that Hulk's out cold. Now, the ref didn't stop it within the time limit, so Hulk's open points, Hulk wins the match. Now, could you argue that it's poor refing again that's lost Dennis the match and potentially left Hulk unconscious or could it just be he didn't look unconscious because he was really protesting that he was out cold but you don't stay on the floor that long after you've won a, won a match against arguably the best 88 kilo and sort of stay there for it was that he was down for a good 10 seconds after the match Hey, listen, let's not pretend that we've both not, and everybody else who's listening to this hasn't looked at the timer when there's a deep sub sunk in on you, and you've got five oh, seconds left in time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't tap in the time limit, it doesn't count. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So you both know who won the match. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Um, I hope you don't tip. Then no, no, that's it. Doesn't matter. Um, so I think like if Diniz does have an issue with it, you bring it up to the ref. Different from an armbar, you know. It's the yeah. you know. It, at the end of the day, it's the players' job to protect themselves. I know that's what the referee's there to do as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but a choke's a choke. It's not as dangerous. You know, there's no long-lasting effects of getting your arm broken or your leg twisted up. Yeah. Um, if he doesn't want to tap, well, whatever, he doesn't want to tap. No. It's not in the time of it. It's not a win. No, um, I agree completely. I think the biggest issue was with how Hulk was celebrating afterwards. Like, he was doing the whole chest beating, peace sign to the sky. and. Well, that's kind of what I mean. Like, you know, in those roles where you go with somebody and um, you, you've, they've got a tight sub on you. At yeah. the end of the match, but you kind of stretch out tapping, like you kind of want to tap, but you're not going to because there's five seconds left on the clock. You know that you got caught. Yeah. If there was an extra ten seconds on the clock, like you both, like if you had a rear naked choke on me mm. and I held it out for five seconds, but really I'm about to pass out. Like I know you won really because the timer was there, but yeah. it's what it is, isn't it? It's, just, it's, it's you can know, argue like when you're tr- rolling in training and you get a leg lock on somebody and uh, you know they're not going to tap you kind of let go let it go but you both know yeah they got caught there and you just move on to the next thing unless you were the guy who's like if this was ever there I'd punch you bro oh no, that's me it's like okay yeah I'll be digging I'll be jabbing my heel into your ribcage until <laughs> street rules do you just <laughs> oh, do you know what I remember um, that's talking about there I don't know if I told this story before on there but this was an open mat must be about three or four years ago and I was wearing the gi, unfortunately. <laughs> but I'm wearing the gi. I was wearing the gi. Don't want to talk to you on this podcast, man. I feel like I should uh, hang up my no gi belt. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was uh, rolling the gi, and it was a blue belt from another gym. I was purple belt at the time, and it was pretty one sided for all. Like you were losing. Well, if yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I I I was dominating the route roll, uh, top position all the time, caught a number of submissions, and afterwards I was like, oh yeah, thanks for the roll, nice to meet you, and then later on, uh, after the open mat in the changing rooms, comes over to me, goes, oh, it's a tough roll that, but you know, if we had gloves on, it would have been a different story. And I was like, well, what do you mean? He goes, well, I, I train. Um, I think he was from a. It was from a club that trains strikes with um, jiu-jitsu in the gi. No, it was Gracie. It was a Gracie jiu-jitsu gym. Slugged off Gracie enough on this podcast. Yeah, we, we, can, we can get away with it. But yeah, it was... Um, yeah, and he comes to me and goes, oh yeah, well, do this, this and this. And if it was gloves, I feel like I would have had a better round with you. And I, I was when I was that tired. I, and I had a lot of tough rounds. I was like, I could not be bothered with continuing the sort of debate of no you wouldn't have mate but <laughs> did you pull guard on him is that why he thinks that he could do you know what I think I actually might I think I might have started on bottom because like my, my whole thing is I think you're a pussy <laughs> someone's <laughs> less experienced it, it's, it's kind of like polite isn't it if you're a, somebody else's gym and you're less experienced you kind of start on bottom then you sweep them to get on top <laughs> so you actually did a dojo storm Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> but it wasn't at his gym, though. It was at somebody else's yeah, yeah. gym. And yeah, after, and I, and I sat there in the car afterwards driving home, just stewing, going, I really should have said something. I really should have said something. I should have said, let's get the gloves on, have one more round. I was just going over all these scenarios in my head. You got to the high road, mate. You came out on top there yeah. in the round and emotionally afterwards <laughs> as well. Yeah, you're the bigger man. But for anybody who's find themselves in that situation where you're going to tell somebody if I had gloves and our first strikes involved I would have had a better round don't do it save your breath because that person will remember it the next time you roll they will not be as polite <laughs> but do you know if you were rolling with somebody you've done that with before and you're in the gi and they pull out these four ounce MMA gloves out of the gi jacket and put them on and start bombing you I'd be like oh it's open season <laughs> and I'd go full combat worlds Get my own slaps. <laughs> or, or do the old of watching um tough five with BJ Penn and um Jens Paul 
and it was uh, one of the a couple of the guys were not taking BJ's coaches um, too seriously. So I think one of the days he just had enough. So he started rolling with him and was like, "You're only going to get out of this role if you escape and get on top and disengage." And the guy was like laughing and joking about it, and the coach was really putting him into some nasty stretches getting him in his subs and when he was tapping he was continuing and then he was getting on top and he was just gently tapping with the palm strikes and the guy was just constantly making jokes again and sort of braiding him and braiding him and then after about five minutes of this the guy that was sort of on the receiving end of it just lost his rag and the guy was like take it seriously you've got to escape you've got to escape and the guy ended up just sort of having a full on tantrum forgetting the weeks prior to this of just mocking this guy's coaching and not taking anything seriously. Sorry, he was getting, he was in the round getting submitted multiple times and slapped and he was still taking the piss out of the coach. Yeah. Oh my God. And it's kind of like, I I see it from the coach's side of being like, you're uncoachable and you've got to show some sort of respect for somebody who's because on that show, they, they've taken time away from their family and home life to come and help these 16 fighters or eight fighters or however many they have to further their career. And then somebody's come along and they're just joking and laughing around in the train and not taking it seriously. I can sort of see where the frustration comes from. Totally. I mean, the, the current season, I think, um, Volkanovski and Ortega is the two jiu-jitsu guys. You've got Craig Jones on one side <laughs> and then Heather on the other. <laughs> I mean, I'd love to be a fly on the wall in, in both of those trend environments. That'd be mega. Have you been watching this season? I've not been watching it. There is you know what? There's, there's been some good fights. There was um, a really good fight. I can't, it was one of the middleweights, and it was a kickboxer versus wrestler. So it was like style versus style. Mm. And this kickboxer looked great. Like the wrestler couldn't get on the inside to take him down. He was chopping his legs, he was picking him apart. And. When he did get in for a takedown, the guy stuffed, got back to his feet, and just continued the round. There was um, another one, a, I think it's the bantamweights and the middleweights, and it was one of the lighter guys. And I saw him, and he was like, "Oh, yeah, he's from the from Ukraine, and he's got like a background in wrestling, and he's a ground up pound style." Watching the build up, and I was like, "This is gonna be a great technical Khabib style fight. Like he's gonna get in, take him down, and just." punish him and it was the most anticlimactic fight ever <laughs> like he got he, he got the takedown and he won it two out of the three rounds but there was very little damage done there was very little transitions he'd sit in his closed guard and he'd stretch out and sort of tap his head and I'm kind of like oh, I expected more from you with the with the the way that you sort of taught yourself yeah, up and Dana doesn't, Dana doesn't like that sort of stuff either does he no. so you know if, unfortunately this to make an exciting fight, which you know is going going on TV, it's entertainment as well as yeah. um, competition. Uh, from what we've seen before, Dana likes it to be exciting. Yeah, you know, um, if it is going to be on the ground, it's got to be active. Um, you've got to be looking for subs or at least hitting hitting the striking and making transitions. Um, you know, we've seen it oftentimes before where people have tried to play that stalling game and just kind of win for position and points. Mm doesn't like it no and you know you look at some uh, somebody's kind of the extreme opposite of that is like Brock Lesnar yeah I remember what the style he used to play he used to hold position throughout mm. the whole round but he'd be punching people in the head at the same the size of those fists as um, well my god like was it against Mark Hunt in like UFC 200 or something like that I'm not sure the, the only fight I've got two fights with Lesnar that stand out to me and it was the first Carwin fight mm. and the Velasquez fight they're the sort of two staple ones in the mind um, as well as the Overeem fight actually Frank Mayer Frank Mayer as well yeah oh, I have to go back through a load of them because I've, I've started going back through fight pass and sort of watching a load of them but I, yeah I agree like if you if you're going to be really good at something at least learn how to strike from there yeah I mean, it's like why well, I'm glad that I came up in more of a, an anime style grappling before mm. I got more into just strict jiu-jitsu. You know, you're thinking about these positions and you get better dominance and control yeah. and holding the positions with the, with the idea that you should be striking mm. or keeping yourself safe from yeah. being hit. 
Um, and it's amazing the difference that you see with players who still have that in mind. And you can tell it when you're rolling with them versus people who've never had to deal with striking and grappling. Um, so kind of like joking to the point that you, you got, who you're rolling with was said before. There is a different element to striking in jiu-jitsu. I'm sure you, could, you, I'm sure you were in dominant enough positions <laughs> to strike in uh, if there was. But um, you know, it's something to be mindful of. If you've, if you've never rolled with striking, yeah. put a pair of gloves on and do it. And when you, you know, doing your, trying to do your deep half guard game, like, can you get punched in the face? You might rethink it. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Like, it, and it's a fun role. I like it. Like, because it's not like you're trying to go for the ground and pound each other and knock each other out. It's, you, you start off with making each other aware of, I can punch here, I can punch here, or actually I shouldn't punch here because I'm making myself vulnerable. Mm-hmm. And it becomes more of a self-defense and uh, more of an awareness. And like we all say, you have to be very present when you're rolling jiu-jitsu. But there are points where you can sort of sit there, you having a bit of a breather, and you can let your mind wander a little bit. But having the strikes in there brings a whole new element of I need to really think about what I'm, what I'm doing. So, you know, having somebody sat in your close garden and just chopping shots down from the top. Yeah. Um, it, it's a completely different element. But what it also does, in, and what Jiu Jitsu is really useful for when you do do it correctly in MMA, when the person on top is striking, the space is there. Like yeah. what, you know, when you're rolling with somebody who's good at jiu-jitsu, what, what makes it really difficult to get stuff off on them is that they don't give away any fucking space. Yeah. If they're going to punch you, there's going to be some space there mm-hmm. to get your underhooks or like set up a knee shield and set up your, um, it's like the kind of like classic triangle set up. Yeah. Like when you're blocking a strike, that Eddie, Eddie Bravo, 10th Planet style set up that, you know, that he shows often. Mm-hmm. Um, and that space is only there when striking's an option. Yeah. Um, but yeah, do it. Stick on the gloves. It's good fun, especially if you can get like a wrestler's ride and just punch the shit out or something, yeah. or like a baggy standing handcuff style position. And like yeah, speaking of like the space with striking, like if someone studied Khabib quite a bit, mm. he leaves no space and he's still able to punch and like he's got his game that calculated. Oh, sorry, had his game that calculated to where he's not going to strike from a compromised position and. If it is from a position where it's having to open space up, he's not in a position where he's going to lose his standing. Yeah, there's a there's a different skill altogether in generating power from a tight position on the floor, isn't there? Yeah. Um, you know, you have to kind of throw your shoulders in a different way and throw your body weight into it. Mm. But like you say, you still need to make sure that you're protecting your position. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a good fun. Try it. Like if you've not done it before, stick on some like seven ounce or eight ounce gloves or mm. whatever the MMA ones are, and just kind of chop them in. I'd even say as well, like, try it with boxing gloves on because it makes you look at your overhooks and underhooks <laughs> like a lot differently. Like, you rely less on actually grabbing the limb. Yeah, yeah. Like, not necessarily like your big 16 ounce gloves, but like eight or tens with a full hand it's not very covered. Big comedy in like a flight of horns. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is like the, uh, the devolution away from the gears, isn't it? Yeah. The ultimate grips, no gi. Uh, no, some okay grips. Comedy fucking <laughs> <Pillow sixth hands. laughs> Basically, how good are your knee shields and underhooks? Yeah. Uh, I'm a platters for everybody, I think. Yeah. yeah. And some uh, shoddy looking triangles trying to get the air. Oh my god, can you imagine? Like, it's a pain in the arse, isn't it? Trying to sink a choking on somebody when you've got gloves on because they just fucking grab you. You love them, yeah. Right away. Um, no matter how much the ref goes. Yeah. Fingers out the gloves. You can't yeah, MMA guys yeah. know exactly what we're talking about. But yeah. um, speaking of like MMA, MMA legends, like we were talking about before, and Brock Lesnar, MMA legend. Um, Anderson, <laughs> he is, he is, he? Uh, Anderson Silva boxing this weekend. Did you see that? Is it? I know he boxed. He boxed last weekend and beat Chavez Jr. Did he? Amazing boxing. I mean, that's not really. A... I mean, we talk about like oh, we were joking about these bullshit celebrity um, boxing matches, like. If you're not saying it, go and watch some of the highlights. That'll be really good boxing. Because like Chavez Jr. is not a chump. Tight head movement, lots of like short, sharp shots, lots of slipping. Really is good boxing. Sort of like style very similar to how he's struck in no. MMA. Much more in, shelled up, lots of head movement, rolling stuff, coming up with hooks. Not that like long and long and lanky yeah. MMA style, chin up, it's head down. I mean, you could argue he could have. Uh, 
a fairly decent career in boxing. Like he didn't take too much damage MMA. He got knocked out with four ounce gloves, didn't he, boy? Did he get knocked out? Was it? He was a bit knocked out, wasn't he? Yeah. So um, against Weidman, he's been knocked out. He has, yeah. Um, but the thing is, he's still uh, he's still right at the top. He's just old, and he yeah. can't compete with the twenty five year olds, no. thirty year olds that are coming through. He's still an amazingly high level athlete. Yeah. And he's got that fight IQ as well. Um, don't go and watch it because it's just tight boxing. It's it's oh, nice. Yeah. We're watching this afternoon. It's really nice boxing. Wow. Um, and then the other one, other MMA legend that I saw this week was. Don Fry on uh, Joe Rogan. Uh, I have to get, I have to get that watch. That was, that was a good one as well because it's like you know talk about like wild days back in I don't know the early days of the UFC like Don Fry is just a fucking mad character. Is he? He's the elbow guy in it. Elbow the groin. Don Fry on it. No, he's the guy with the. We've covered the match before with the Japanese guy. Yeah. Like unfortunately, that's his most <laughs> well known <laughs> thing. Uh, but he, I think he won. Um, it's a UFC 6 tournament yeah I think to get on the old Google for this but I can imagine him uh, imagine there being some really good stories with that yeah uh, well the, what was going on in the podcast uh, Joe Rogan was interviewing him and he was basically trying to get out of him when he started his MMA career mm. and uh, you know Tom Fry's just sat there smoking his cigar and uh, so Joe was like you know when did you you know, first uh, get into the UFC I hear about the UFC and uh, Don Fry just then starts telling stories about when he used to be a farrier and <laughs> how he used to be like um, a restraining person at like a psych ward oh, wow. and, so, and then Joe Rogan was like oh, so when did you get into the UFC and he was like yeah and then I was a doorman and he's fucking rambling on going on about how he was in the fire department loads of great stories about him being just a fucking brawler from back in the day so I don't think he's actually skills. like had a notable debut I just think it sounds like the guy just fell into it didn't it I think he just uh, from from what I can remember I think he just his first UFC thing and he'd had uh, MMA fights before this was he, the UFC 6 tournament mm. it was Dan Seven's teammate wasn't he yes yeah. I think so so I'd sooner put him in Google to sort of see which one it was his uh, first headline is he's interested in fight, fighting Francis Ngannou at like 55 it. years old and it's like fair play he had a comeback recently, didn't he, against somebody that he fought um, earlier on in his career, like, maybe not fairly recently, but certainly within the last 10 years. Um, I vaguely recall that, yeah. Yeah, you know, that was a quite a scrappy fight. Yeah. Um, but those early days of the UFC were wild, because it's like those clash of styles. Yeah. Before even people started using gloves, mm. um, still bare knuckle. <laughs> <laughs> that boxer coming with one glove on one hand and bare knuckle on the other. Can you imagine? That's like, <laughs> that's like, I don't know what that's like. It's like turning up to um, when, when your mates are saying that it's a fancy dress party and you turn up for Halloween <laughs> and you're the only one in fancy dress. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Absolutely stitched up. But like, uh, same like, like going for a kick about one foot's got studs on one foot's actually turned everything like I don't know it's what the weather's going to be like <laughs> I don't know be a distinctive fun is that <laughs> maybe you explain that again that we were just talking about there before where it slaps like, <laughs> no gi no gi and the uh, fucking comedy boxing glove for grips oh man <laughs> um, but yeah those early days were wild like no gloves people figured out like you can actually punch harder and protect your hands more when you're wearing gloves yeah and like tank habit oh wow. what an animal what was that fight he had? It was like I think it was towards the end of his career where where he just sort of just went hell for leather. Tank Abbott fight Kimbo Slice. Yeah. <laughs> like he was enough. I can, do you know we've got to, we've got to put it there. He did a lot for bringing MMA to a bigger audience again because he became that internet celebrity, and soon as he got into the ultimate fight house he would have brought in those fighters the fight fans who were oh I'm not, not doing that huggy, huggy stuff on, on the mats and they'd sit there watching boxing and the street fights and then they'd follow his story through the ultimate fight house it's a bit funny that Kimbo Slice is an internet celebrity yeah yeah <laughs> Kimbo Slice versus Jake Paul. I've never understood how how his haircut worked. 
I mean, he, that dude is a scary motherfucker. Yeah. Like, I remember watching those, back, you know, street, the backyard fights when I was a kid, and I was like, Jesus Christ. Mm. Um, but I remember watching him fight, I think he was a, a police officer in a, in a He was an actual MMA fighter as yeah. well. That was a good fight. And yeah. He didn't have a, he did, it wasn't all his own way. That was the first fight that I saw where he didn't win. Yeah. Um, but um, I noticed when they took, he went to the ground, didn't he? And then everyone was sort of like stopping it, standing it back up. Yep. Apparently, that guy, the guy, the police officer who won, lost his job after that. For the fight? F- ended up fighting in the UFC a couple of times. Okay. Yeah. Fair play. Only recall that because I listened to Joe Rogan talk about it recently. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'll have to get on to that Don Fry episode of Joe Rogan. Like, I've got to be honest, I've not listened to him much recently. Since he moved on to Spotify. Has his quality dropped? I don't know. If I'm perfectly honest, Joe Rogan is one of those ones that I don't listen to on the audio format. I like to sit down and watch it. Yeah. Um, and since it moved off YouTube, it's a bit harder to do that because you mm. can't get it up on the Spotify app on the TV, like the video, the video much, thing. It? So it's like you've got it on your phone and then you try to cast it and it's yeah. just a complete faff. So I've, I've pretty much stopped watching it. And oh, all wow. the stuff that I watch is like the YouTube highlights. Yeah. Which is a shame because you know, I've been listening to Joe Rogan since like episode 190 or something like that back in mm. the day um, and there's a lot of good stuff but it's just that one last step of convenience yeah. unfortunately and um, you know, I've got other podcasts to listen to in the week no that's it um, I find with Joe Rogan a little bit as well that you can get like caught up in the same subject for a couple of weeks so you can kind of listen to weeks, it. months or years years <laughs> um, DMT elk meat yeah <laughs> shroom tech <laughs> <laughs> so you can kind of drop out for a couple of weeks and then pick back up a few weeks later on yeah and not really feel like you've missed out on too much so yeah because I was always one of them ones I'll look for who's on, who's who's the guest and if I don't know the name I'll have a look a little read of the synopsis and if it's someone who seems relatively interesting I'll, I'll watch it or listen to it but unless it's like a comedian that I know I won't listen to them ones or if it's somebody like a fighter I, I've been getting very picky with it because I saw a clip of the Gordon Ryan one and it just seemed like two hours of Joe blowing smoke up his ass and it's kind of like yeah he's great but everybody knows how good a jiu player he is get into something a bit more interesting yeah I mean he's an athlete at the end of the yeah. day what more do you want from him it's like Not I mean true. like the thing is with Joe Rogan a bit now it's such a uh, platform to get on yeah that I think people but I, I, I used to like it back in the day where he'd have some good guests on but he used to have like Brian Redban on and he used to talk shit and then Duncan Trussell and yeah it's just good fun man. they were the ones that I like yeah like Joey Diaz Joey Diaz I, I, has he been on since he's been on Spotify I, I don't know I'm sure he has um, just he's fucking such a ridiculous human being I can <laughs> listen to him his stories 24-7 <laughs> And it's the way he goes, Joe Rogan, Joe Rogan, listen to this, Joe Rogan. He's such a ridiculous <laughs> human being, he's got some of the best stories that are amazing. Um, but less about other podcasts, more yeah. about this one. Uh, <laughs> I think that's pretty much covered everything we wanted to I think talk. that's everything, yeah. Then, yeah. Uh, one more week closer to lockdown being ended. Yep. So, again, if you're starting the sport, make sure you go back and listen to the uh, We Put the Fun in Fundamentals episode gives you a load of good information on what to expect, how to approach your first session, and also getting over those first couple of weeks where you're not sure like, of the etiquette and things like that. And go check out the techniques, um, share them with your friends, try them out on your, on, your, on your teammates, and let us know what you want to see and also how you get on with the techniques. Yeah, and as well, we covered a lot of topics on the podcast, but on my episode, but if yeah. there's something that you've got a question about that we didn't uh, didn't answer, mm. um, stick it in the comments. Yeah, well, definitely. Like, it's always a topic that we want to talk about again, yeah. because there's always going to be new people coming into the sport. Um, a lot of the ideas are always going to be pretty similar, mm. um, but it's always good for people to hear them, and if it's something that we've not talked about before, get it on, because you can guarantee somebody else has got the same question. Oh, definitely. And again, before we go, make sure you subscribe, like, share, drop us a comment below as well, and we'll see you next week. We've got Bonafide PT, Coach by Sai, and Grapplers Academy on all social media platforms and on YouTube.